So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's, uh, today it's a, it's a big honor to have our uh, uh, Young Investigator Award winner of uh, of the uh, last year's uh, OTS. So it's uh, it's really a big name in the uh, in the oligonucleotide field. And his name is uh, Alex uh, Garanto uh, or Alexandro Garanto. I must uh, say to uh, say it properly. So uh, Alex is a uh, is an uh, assistant professor at the Department of uh, Pediatrics and Human Genetics of the Radboud UMC in uh, in Nijmegen, that's in the Netherlands, and he he uh, obta obtained his PhD from the University of uh, Barcelona in 2011 under the supervision of Professor uh, Gonzalez Duarte and Professor Marfani, and after a short uh, postdoc with Professor Marfani at the University of Barcelona. Alex moved to the to the Netherlands to start working with uh, Professor uh, Rob Collin, and uh, in the Netherlands he worked on uh, the design and the characterization of uh, oligonucleotides uh, as a potential approach to treat uh, inherited retinal diseases. Uh, and since 2020, I think it's a, a very big achievement. He is recognized as a group leader at the Radboud UMC. And his research focuses on the development of molecular therapies, mainly using RNA-based approaches for inherited neurometabolic diseases and inherited retinal diseases. So, Alex, it's a it's a it's a big honor to have you here uh, on the OTS webinar series, and uh, the screen is yours. Thanks, Ronald, for the nice introduction. I'm going to start sharing the screen. Does it work? Yes, yeah. it works okay. perfect. So thank you again for the, the introduction. And uh, as Ronald indicated, I'm going to talk about antisense oligonucleotide-based therapies for inherited retinal diseases. And I'm going to give a journey on how we went from mutation to and how we expect to reach a clinical trial with the work that we have been doing uh, here in Nijmegen at the Radboud UMC. So I would like to start thanking the OTS again for giving me the opportunity to show this work. And I going to, if it works, yeah, to start with my disclosures because I'm inventor on several patents describing the use of this technology to treat uh, uh, inherited retinal diseases. And why the eye and why uh, it's so uh, a nice model to, to study therapeutics in, in this particular organ. So first of all, the eye is an accessible organ. It's contained, it has its own blood retinal barrier. And that means that whatever we deliver to the eye stays in, in the eye. The, the retina that I will explain in the next slide, what it is, uh, it's formed by non-dividing cells. That means that our therapeutic molecule, one, uh, once it's delivered, will not di be diluted in each cell division. However, if we don't have a, a population of cells to target, that will mean that we also cannot treat anything. The eye is also an immunoprivileged organ, meaning that the immune response is rather low or absent. And uh, retinal diseases are progressive disorders and therefore there's a window of opportunity. In addition, uh, both for studying the disease progression and in case of a, a clinical trial, the readouts are non-invasive. And more important, when we want to reach a clinical trial, we have two eyes, so meaning that one eye uh, can be the, its own control. So each individual will be its own control. And we always compare to the contralateral eye. So if we go a little bit more about the function of the eye, well, I assume that everyone is aware that thanks to the eyes, we can see what is going on uh, around us. And this happens because at the back part of the eye, there's a neuronal tissue called retina that is formed by uh, very specialized cells. Uh, and, so, and one of them, well, one of these subtypes of cells are the photoreceptors that are the photosensitive cells that capture the light and convert it into electrical and uh, chemical signals that travel to the brain where this information will be processed and an image will be created. In patients with retinal diseases, what happens is that progressively they lose this ability to see and therefore they become blind. And when there's a genetic cause, cause behind these uh, diseases, we call them inherited retinal diseases or in short IRD. And those are monogenic or diseases, meaning that they are caused by mutations in one particular gene. They are highly uh, heterogeneous at genetic and clinical level. And I will explain in the next slide 
uh, why? And as I already mentioned, they are progressive. Usually the first symptoms appear in the first or second decade of life and patients are legally blind in the fourth, uh, sometimes at the third and sometimes at the fifth decade of life. So in this scheme with a lot of genes and, and different um, uh, circles, you can see different uh, subtypes of inherited retinal diseases. And I'm not going to go into details, but what I want you to check is that, um, let me put the pointer. Uh, this one. So basically uh, each circle is a different IRD and all the words that are written there are genes causing that particular IRD. And as you can see, there's uh, in, in some cases overlap. And this is because uh, the phenotypes are quite similar, especially in late stages of disease, it's quite difficult to differentiate whether it's one type or the other type. So, so far uh, mutations in more than 250 genes have been associated with IRD. And still, despite we have all this knowledge, uh, around 35% of the patients do not have a genetic diagnosis, meaning that they don't have a gene that can be eventually uh, used as a therapeutic approach in the era of genetic therapies. And today I'm going to mainly focus on ABCA4, we, that co uh, causes target disease, but I will also talk about CEP290 that causes liver congenital amaurosis. So starting with ABCA4, uh, it's a rather large gene. It, uh, it is a 128 KB uh, long. It contains 50 exons and the cDNA, so the coding part that uh, will produce a protein, it's around 7 KB. Uh, it encodes for the ATP binding cassette subfamily A member for protein, which is a transmembrane protein that it's involved in the visual cycle. So as you can imagine, ABCA4 is then quite important for um, vision. And it is located in this disc. So this is a photoreceptor and the photoreceptor has the synapse, the, nucleo, the nucleus, the inner segment where all the proteins are synthesized and then they need to travel to the outer segment where the phototransduction occurs. And the phototransduction occurs in this membrane, uh, the membranous disc. And you can see here that in the rim of this disc is where ABCA4 is located. And basically it, uh, transports from the, uh, the, the disc lumen to the outside, the uh, 11C's retinal, that is one of the factors of the visual cycle. So I mentioned that ABCA4 causes target disease, and indeed, uh, it's the uh, target disease is the most frequent uh, juvenile macular dystrophy affecting uh, one in um, 10,000 uh, 10, individuals. It's a progressive disease like the other IRDs, and it's caused by biallelic mutations in ABCA4. So it's a recessive disease. Both alleles need to be mutated. And so far, there's quite a strong phenotype-genotype correlation in the sense that uh, startup cases are almost all the time caused by mutations in ABCA4. And also, more than 2,000 unique variants have been identified for ABCA4. And here there's a representation of one of the latest works uh, from the Nijmegen team, where uh, you can see that there are different types of uh, mutations. And uh, especially it's interesting that around 21% of those mutations uh, affect the splicing. And I will uh, go back to this later on. So when we think about pathogenic variant identification going to the very beginning, because there's this strong uh, correlation, we could think about, okay, we can do Sanger sequencing that we need to uh, screen all the, the exons and uh, separately, or also nowadays, at least in the Netherlands, most of the patients undergo to a uh, whole exon sequencing or West on a regular sc a genetic screening. So in those uh, particular approaches, we only focus on the exons. So the parts of the gene that uh, have the information and the surrounding areas like the splice sites. So that means that we can only find uh, mutations in the coding region because for a, a long time, we thought that all the, the possible mutations should be in those areas because the introns are always being removed during splicing. However, a big proportion of our Stargard cases uh, were genetically unexplained, meaning that we had uh, patients were with no allele uh, discovered in, in, in ABCA4, or only one and missing the second hit. 
So at that time, it was like, okay, how to proceed with this? How is it possible? Is there another gene that causes this disease or we are missing uh, information? And then the, the group of uh, Professor Franz Kremers uh, at the Radboud UMC and Professor uh, Elfriede de Baere at the Ghent University uh, decided to, well, what about if we sequence the entire locus and uh, we uh, check what happens there? And this was done in an aluplex based uh, uh, sequencing manner. And uh, what uh, they did was, well, this is just that you see that the, the gene is uh, rather big. So what they did is start with 36 patients where previously one or no ABC4 variant was reported. After this sequencing, basically uh, 94 independent novel intronic variants that were not described before uh, appeared. Of course, at that time, there was not that much information. So everything was compared to the RefSec and the, the thousand genomes, but not that much uh, extra could be done. And of course, some uh, coding uh, variants were also identified. So the big challenge or the initial challenge was how to select from these 94 independent variants, which ones could be uh, potentially uh, deleterious. And for that, we used uh, Alamut. At that time, there were five uh, predictions. Nowadays, there are only four, and this is a, 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 a recent screenshot. So for that reason, you only see four. And in this particular case, it's the minus 506 uh, variant that is located in intron 7. And what you can see here, this is the normal allele. This is the, the mutant allele. And uh, as you can appreciate, all the predictions increase uh, this value. Uh, and, and this is in, in the, the green part will be the acceptor side. And then as you can also see in the uh, other side, there's a donor predicted with a relatively high score. So what we decided to do is go mutation by mutation that we found or variant, because at that time we didn't know if it was pathogenic or not. And we put as a threshold that 20%, if there was a more than 20% change in the, the scale and take into account that it, each of these uh, programs use a different scale and at least in three out of the five, and also there was an acceptor or donor close by, it should be included. So with this, we ended up with 11 variants. And now the question was like, well, how are we going to test the effect of these 11 variants? ABCA4 is expressed in the retina. And we don't have cells of all these patients. Can we do it somehow? And then it's when we started using MIDI genes. And this was also a... a work on uh, in the group of Professor Kremers with Ricardo and Mubin as a PhDs working on that. And basically they covered the entire gene with uh, big fragments of DNA containing multiple exons the, um, between seven and 10 KB each fragment. And why this was uh, done like this is because uh, in the past while we were uh, studying all these variants, what we saw is that the, the size of the mini gene is important. We started with a mini gene for another variant and uh, with the variant and 500 base pairs around. And the result was completely different when we had a bigger mini gene with a bigger part. And even if we had the flanking exons, the result was different. So we decided that the content, uh, the context was really important. And for that reason, all these big fragments. So uh, with these tools, we were able to screen these 11 variants and how we can do that. And again, this is uh, the minus 506 example that I explained before. We have a big uh, part of the genomic region in, inserted into a plasmid that is flanked by two rhodopsin exons. And this is just in case uh, we cannot use uh, any uh, internal exon because in some cases the introns are too big that we can only uh, include one exon and we can have our variant of interest. Then we transfect this plasmid in, uh, to HEC 293T cells that they transfect really well. You have 80% to 90% efficiency. We wait at 24, 48 hours, isolate the RNA and perform an RT-PCR. And then we can clearly see that there's a, a 
correct transcript, that is what we will expect in the wild type midi gene. But when we have the minus 506 variant, there's a little bit of the wild type, but there's something bigger that if we uh, sequence afterwards, it contains a pseudo exon of 53 nucleotides, which is exactly this, the, the, the space that was between the new acceptor and the cryptic uh, donor site. So with this, we could prove that at least from these 11 variants, six of them cause a splicing defect. But was this enough? And uh, because we started to see that um, there were a lot of uh, mutations in the introns and alloplex sequencing was not uh, cheap, let's say. So the group of uh, Professor Kremers also investigated in cheaper ways to be able to screen as many patients as possible. And for that, they use SMIPS-based sequencing. And those SMIPS are just probes that bind to the region of interest. And then uh, you can uh, pull them. And by designing 4,000 SMIPS, uh, the entire gene could be covered with at least three probes covering the same region to have a significance. And then because they have this random uh, tag, uh, you can pull samples and, uh, and then it's easy to combine and it's sample more or less can be sequenced for 30 euros. So this resulted in uh, solving uh, more than 1,000 Stargard cases. Uh, but then at that time, as you can imagine, if you find all these, we found these uh, new uh, intronic variants, how to analyze all of them. If out of 36 patients, we had 96 variants, out of 1,000, you can uh, estimate that it will be a lot. So there would be a limitation in human power, but at the same time, a new software uh, appeared online, Splice AI. And with this tool, uh, it is possible to automate the uh, assessment of these variants because uh, this program can detect the gain or loss of acceptor or donor sites in combination with cryptic donors or the, uh, acceptor sites that are in the surrounding area. So based on that, uh, it was possible to assess uh, different variants and uh, those that have uh, differences were tested in the Medigen system. And this, uh, you already saw this graph. Uh, what showed is that 11% of all the variants were deep intronic variants and that 21% of them also uh, affected splicing because there's a 10% of variants that affect the non-canonical splicing sites. But of course, Stargard disease is a rare disease. So if we compare in number of alleles, you can see that most of the mutations are uh, affecting one or two patients, maybe three in, in, in general. And there are only a few of them that are quite recurrent. If we see how they are distributed, we classify them in, uh, as near exon variants. And those usually create an exon elongation but the deep intronic variants are distributed in several of the introns. And so far we have not ruled out whether there can be hotspots or not. It seems that some uh, introns are more prone to have intronic variants than others, but in general, they are distributed everywhere. And of course, more variants are appearing so far in new studies. So when we think about mutations in the splice sites, uh, well, if we have a normal situation and this is the gene, all the exons will be uh, together, uh, copy, well, um, spliced uh, in together. And if we have a splice set mutation, we can have multiple situations. We can have exon skipping. We have uh, intron retention or, the entire, or, or just an exon elongation because there's a cryptic site in the, in the intron. In any case, there will be a transcript that is out of frame and probably there will be no protein produced. And for the deep intronic, in contrast, what we see is that there needs to be always a cryptic donor or acceptor site. And what those variants do is insert a pseudo exon that also disrupts the reading frame, usually contains a premature stop codon and meaning that also the protein will not be produced. So, and this is where our group uh, led by Professor Colling and myself uh, started to work on, on it. And uh, I will present some uh, results from uh, Nuri and Tom, two of our PhDs. So this was the initial uh, example. These are the six splicing defects that I mentioned before from the screening out of the 36 patients. What we did was design 
uh, oligonucleotides for the, the, the six variants. And uh, as you can see, two of them have the more or less the same splicing defect. And the way we did it was uh, creating the MIDI gene, transfecting it into the HEC293 T cells, wait more or less 16, 20 hours to allow the plasmid to be transcribed and produce uh, RNA. Then we deliver the AON or the ASO. And after 48 hours, we collected the cells and do the RNA analysis. So at the, in, in that particular paper first, we were using 2OME, but I'm going to focus in our most recent uh, study where we have targeted a lot of uh, ultra rare variants that were dis, uh, discovered in the 1000 uh, patient article. And in here, we use a two MOE uh, phosphorotyroid uh, oligos. And uh, this is an example of a deep intronic variant that introduces a pseudo exon of 127 nucleotides. And we designed uh, two AONs. And this particular variant introduces uh, two pseudo exons, one, the one of 127 and one uh, smaller. And then what we can see is that when we treat with the antisense, uh, the pseudo exon disappears and actually the correct transcript increases. So meaning that we have redirected splicing. We also use a sense oligonucleotide as a control. And you can see that this oligo did not uh, affect the, the, the splicing defect. And uh, at the right panel, you have uh, in the right panel, you have the quantification of those uh, bands. We did the same for the near exon variants, but in this case, uh, we follow a different um, strategy. Uh, while in the pseudo exon, we usually try to target the splicing enhancers to try to exclude the, um, the pseudo exon. In here, what we aim is to block the new splice site in order to make uh, the uh, force the machinery to go to the old splice site and redirect splicing. So as you can see here in the non-treated, this lane here, uh, there's a, uh, a higher band. So there's this 36 nucleotide uh, elongation. And when we treat with uh, both antisense oligonucleotides, the splicing is redirected to the correct one. And in the case of uh, AUN2, there's still a little bit of mutant. And again, the sense oligonucleotide did not do anything. So is this medigen system robust enough? So at that time we were considering, well, it seems that it is, but it would be good if we can somehow show it. And we found out that we were able to detect ABCA4 expression in fibroblasts at very low levels. So going again to the same example I've been putting all the time, the minus 506, uh, this is the picture of a control fibroblast line and uh, the patient line that is a compound heterozygous. So meaning that uh, only one allele has this particular mutation. And we are using cyploxamide to block the nonsense mediated decay to see what happens when uh, the transcript is not degraded. So basically is when we see the pseudoaxon more or less in a 50-50 um, situation, meaning that that allele uh, produces the pseudoaxon and this pseudoaxon is not observed in the control. So we delivered the, the three AUNs that we uh, designed and we can clearly see that AUN1 and AUN3 work. So what's the same result that we obtained in the HEC293T experiment with the MIDI gene? And the answer is yes. So we can clearly see that the results were compatible and that more or less we already knew based on, on these results in the MIDI gene that the effect of this mutation was almost a full effect and that 90 to 95% of the transcript produced by uh, that variant would be um, contain a pseudoaxon. So it's kind of robust with what we observed. So we could conclude that at least uh, it was recapitulated, but then, of course, there are exceptions. And uh, in this work that we did together with a group of uh, Professor Cheetham in London, we uh, were studying four variants that uh, were found in Intron 36. Uh, actually, variant M9 was previously reported uh, in the past, and it was clearly associated with disease. But when we did the Medigene assay, we can clearly see that in this particular case, while the other variants had a clear insertion of a pseudoaxon, this one, okay, there was 
pseudoactin insertion, but the proportion was rather low for a, to have a severe effect and cause the disease. So at that time, then we started to figure out what could be. We also had uh, already uh, some clues uh, based on uh, CEP290, but also another study of ABC4 that I will mention in a couple of slides. But then what, what we did is uh, we had uh, fibroblast cells of this patient. And uh, the good thing is that using fibroblasts for peripheral, uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells or other type of cells like urine uh, cells, we can reprogram those cells into IPS and we can generate either retinal organoids or photoreceptor precursor uh, cells. And this is actually what we did. We developed these photoreceptor uh, precursor cells or PPCs. And after doing this, we could see that in the control upon cycloxamide treatment to block a nonsense mediated decay, there was a tiny bit of pseudoaxone. But in the patient itself, that again, it's compound heterozygote, so only one allele has this mutation. We could see that already without cyclo cycloxamide, the pseudoaxone was there. And with cycloxamide, the ratio was 50 50, again, showing that this allele was introducing almost in all the copies the uh, uh, pseudoaxon. But as I mentioned, we already had some clues from the past. Uh, in this work that uh, I did with uh, Dr. Silvia Albert, we were investigating two variants in intron 30. And those particular variants also are quite recurrent and were described in literature as the cause of the disease. And in fibroblasts, as you can see here, we did not observe anything. In the medigene also, we could only see uh, shadows, or, but then when we went to the PPCs, it was clear that there was a pseudoaxon insertion that, uh, in, in that this transit also went to a nonsense mediated decay because uh, it was uh, rescued after, uh, after delivering, well, after treatment with cycloxamide. So basically we have several splicing effects that are retina specific. In the case of M1, M2, it could expl be explained by the fact that they do not generate an acceptor or donor site. They just create a new splicing enhancer. So it could be that this is a retina specific enhancer. And for that reason in the other uh, tissues, we could not see it. But for the M9, that was not the case, but overall, the Medigen system is a reliable system, uh, especially for those cases that create an acceptor or donor site. So using these PPCs that basically uh, it consists in a 30-day differentiation, we deliver the AON uh, genotically, so directly into the medium. After 24 hours, we deliver the cycloxamide and after 24 hours post cycloxamide or 48 post AON treatment, we harvest the cells, isolate the RNA, and perform the RNA analysis. So in this case, we were studying the M9 that I presented before. We had four uh, antisense oligonucleotides, and we uh, use uh, the system to assess the efficacy. And we can see that AON6 and 7 were the most promising ones because we can see that the uh, upper band, that is the pseudoaxone, is decreased, and the correct band, it's increased. So what uh, we have done so far is what well, we have identified more than 30 splicing defects in ABCA4, and we have been able to correct them using AONs for all of them. But as I mentioned before, most of these variants are uh, ultra rare and only present in one, maybe three, uh, with some exceptions. So how we can proceed with this? And for this, of course, we were thinking about, okay, the only option to make this AON to reach the clinic and benefit the patient would be with end of one trials. And together with the Leiden UMC, uh, Erasmus MC, and the Radboud UMC, the Dutch Center for RNA Therapeutics was created. And in the, this uh, DCRT uh, center, we uh, aim to bring those end of one uh, cases to the clinic. And I'm not going to give more details because already last November, Professor Bileke van Rommom uh, gave, gave a webinar for the OTS and you can find it in the website of the OTS online uh, if you want to know more about these end of one trials uh, in, that we are planning to do. And actually uh, for the eye, 
the minus five or six that I've been presenting as an example is one of the targets that we are aiming for. But then we, we have designed all these uh, oligos and what's next? So how we can show efficacy and safety in a more reliable model rather than a midi gene. So at the beginning we were considering, well, what about animal models? But the knockout ABC4 has a very slow phenotype that does not fully mimic the human situation. In addition, AONs are sequence dependent. So that means that we need to include the human region in the genome of the mouse. And that means that we need to humanize the model, but we have too many variants. So if we need to generate a model for every single variant, it's going to be, uh, well, quite laborious. And at the same time, probably uh, we can have the problem that the splicing might not be conserved. And that actually already happened to us in the past. So for step 90, that is going to be the last part of this presentation. We, um, develop a humanized mouse model that was not recapitulating the splicing defect observed in human. And when we study more in detail what was going on, we found that only the primate, uh, the primates, uh, well, when we transfected the midi gene in several cell lines, only the primate cell lines, including human, were able to recognize that pseudo exon, while the lower species like pig, cow, um, rat, mouse, uh, only uh, inserted a tiny bit of uh, pseudo exon. So in that sense, we were able to see that there's, there are uh, differences between the splicing machinery in mouse and in human, and that therefore not always a mouse will recapitulate the human phenotype. And recently, uh, my postdoc, Irene Vázquez Domínguez and myself wrote uh, some guidelines or things that uh, we should take into consideration before generating any humanized model to be sure that it will have a the splicing defect. So we decided to put all our efforts in uh, cellular models. And this is a work that involves uh, many people. Uh, and uh, here you have a picture of all the people working at this moment on in this technology in, in Nijmegen and uh, also uh, in projects that we do together in, in Twente. And we want to use organoids. And organoids are 3D structures derived directly from the IPS but we want to see whether we can improve and observe an effect at protein level, but also morphology. Can we improve the model? Can we have a complete retina? Can we uh, create a retina on a chip, et cetera, et cetera. The problem that we have with organoids is that they need a long time differentiation. So more than 150 days. And here, uh, an example of how a organoid look at day 120, so you see all the laminated part, this could become the, the, the retinal part. And then later on at 180 days, you can see these brush borders that these are the, the uh, photoreceptors. However, there are also papers nowadays that suggest that for mature photoreceptors, uh, we need to wait 250 to 275 days. So as you can imagine, this is quite laborious. But at the same time, we know from the past that uh, organoid data is enough to start a clinical trial. And this brings me to the last part of my talk that is the, the CEP290 uh, clinical trial. And I will start uh, explaining uh, labor congenital amaurosis, which is an inherited retinal disease caused by loss of vision uh, in early life, uh, early in life. And it's uh, affecting one every 60,000 indi 60, individuals. So far, there are 20, more than 20 genes causing mutations in more than 20 genes causing the disease. And CEP290 is the most recurrently mutated gene. And in particular, there's an, a deep intronic variant that causes 10 to 15% of all the level congenital amaurosis cases in some populations. So this disease is characterized by nystagmus, that is the involuntary movement of the eye, amaurotic papules, that uh, those papules do not react to light. And then the, the kids uh, have this oculodigital sign that they poke their eye trying to get some uh, stimulation. This particular variant is in intron uh, 26, and it's recognized by the splicing machinery and creates a uh, pseudo exon insertion with a premature stop codon in around 50% of the transcripts uh, in lymphoblast and uh, fibroblast cells. 
So during a lot of time, we were considering what's going on in the retina because step 290 is a gene that is expressed uh, in all the cells of our body or almost all of them. And we know that mutations in this gene cause severe syndromes that are, uh, some of them even cause uh, uh, the death in, in early stages of life. So, but for this particular mutation, only the retina was affected. So in a beautiful uh, work uh, done in the group of uh, Professor Mike Chita, basically using organoids, they found out that actually the splicing machinery in the retina recognizes this pseudo exon even better. And only 10% of the correct CEP290 is produced in the retina, explaining why uh, this particular tissue is affected by uh, this mutation. So the idea is like in the other cases, we have uh, the antisense oligonucleotide, the pseudo exon is not recognized and we can restore the mRNA again. So because of the time, I'm going to uh, go to the preclinical work quite fast. So in 2012, uh, Professor Rob Collin designed and studied the efficacy of these uh, oligonucleotides in patient-derived fibroblast cells. Also around that time, Xavier Gerard in France uh, checked the, the, uh, the efficacy in patient-derived fibroblasts. During my postdoc, I was looking about, uh, on the efficacy in patient-derived fibroblasts, but also in the humanized mouse model I mentioned as uh, before that the tiny bit of pseudoexone insertion, but nothing comparable to what happens in human. And we also at the same time check whether the, the administration of the oligo into the retina could have any toxic effect in the eye. And we, uh, the group of my Chitam also uh, studied the efficacy in patient derived retinal organs. So in uh, then this led to another work where we, uh, this uh, molecule was licensed to ProQR and uh, was called QR110 at the time, but nowadays is known as Sepofarsen. And what uh, we did is check, um, well, mainly the, in our case, we did the, the mouse part, but what the other uh, groups did was check how long the antisense oligonucleotide can be detected in the retina. And for that, they uh, injected an oligo that was uh, fluorescently labeled and study for how long they could detect it in the rabbit retina. And they could find it, uh, find it at up to 101 days. They also check in the rabbit whether there would be cytokine uh, because they are quite sensitive whether the cytokines will be, um, yeah, uh, um, what would be, increase somehow after uh, AON uh, delivery. And of course, they also check the toxicity in, in non-human primates. In addition, an off-target uh, assessment was done and no off-targets, uh, well, predicted off-targets were found as uh, it was shown in uh, this picture. So overall, the QR110 was ready to go to the clinic. And in 2017, the first patient was uh, injected with this uh, drug. And uh, at the end of 2018, uh, the first results were uh, presented. So also they were published, the interim results. So a little bit about the clinical trial. So two doses were uh, selected. Uh, there was a first loading injection with uh, 160 or 320 micrograms of AON. And then every three months, there was a maintenance dose uh, with half of the amount that was um, delivered initially. And this was done in six adults and in uh, six children, but one of the pediatric patients uh, quit. And there's uh, actually a case report afterwards that after one single injection, there was also improvement in that patient. So they assess the best corrected visual acuity. That is mainly uh, the, the letter code that you can see here, the test of the size and the, the a change in minus 0 0.3 Lockmar is clinically meaningful. And you can compare here the contralateral eye that is the non-injected one with the treated eye. And there was clearly a clear improve, uh, improvement in the, eight patients at that time in the interim results. 
they also check whether this was maintained in time. And uh, in the blue line is the treated tie and the gray one, the untreated tie. And this is every uh, month uh, starting from three months after the injection. And we can see that after six months, the drug, while well, the effect was quite uh, maintained. Uh, you also can see that in each time point, there are less patients. This is because these were the interim results and not all patients started the treatment at the same time. So in each time point, there were less. But overall, seven out of the 11 patients showed improvement. And um, in a more recent uh, work, they, pre uh, they presented this uh, slide at uh, Arvo last year, and uh, basically all the parameters of this phase uh, that they assess the visual, uh, best corrected visual acuity, the sensitivity to uh, light and the mobility test, in all cases, there was a, a improvement. So the, the phase one, two results seem to be very promising. And with this, um, Procure started a second, uh, well, a phase two, three uh, trial called Illuminate, where the, the idea was to have uh, three groups. And in one study group, they were having a, a higher dose and then another one with lower dose. And then the sham procedure that it was just the same injection procedure. And also there was uh, injections at, at the beginning, then three months afterwards, and then instead of every three months, uh, every six months. Unfortunately, um, a month ago, there were these uh, disappointing news that uh, the phase two, three uh, trial failed. Basically, um, I don't have more information. This is all what is in the press release. There were no differences between the three groups, the sham, the high dose, and the low dose. There was also not um, uh, differences in the uh, secondary endpoints. But overall, what it can be concluded, at least from Sepofarsen, is that it was uh, well tolerated by the eye. And uh, this was consistent with the results of the phase one trial. And of course, this opens now many questions. And I'm sure that the researchers involved in this work are looking already to the data and trying to figure out uh, whether this can be explained. And we will hear probably in the coming months after all these data have been uh, analyzed. So what's the current status of IRDs at this moment? So um, I talk about CEP290 and ABC4. CEP290 is the, the trial just finished, the phase two, three clinical trial. For ABC4, we are aiming to go to NF1 but of course, if we can, be, uh, for the most recurrent mutations, if we can do a normal clinical trial, it will be also uh, considered. Uh, there's also a phase two, three clinical trial for ashes 2 a and, and also phase one, two clinical trial for rhodopsin. And so far, three other genes have been targeted preclinically um, in, uh, for uh, inherited retinal diseases. But there are also other AONs being uh, studied for other eye diseases like age-related macular degeneration or corneal diseases. So to finalize the take-home messages of this talk is that well, for the ABCA4 part, deep intronic variants explain most of the unsolved cases and maybe this can be extrapolated to other genes that, uh, well, or mainly all the cases that we have in house without any uh, genetic cause. And uh, for that reason, whole genome sequencing can help to solve these issues. In uh, most of the cases, the, the splicing defect identified was a pseudoexome insertion. And uh, this could be uh, assessed with splicing assays uh, using MIDI genes. And those are very helpful with some exceptions that have retina specific splicing defects. Patient-derived cellular models are more uh, suitable for rescue experiments because of we have the entire gene context. In the MIDI gene, we only have part of it, but in uh, ABCA4, it's a rather large gene. And we uh, also know that the local delivery to the eye is very efficient and safe and also well tolerated. And uh, at this moment, several AONs, as I showed in the previous slide, are currently in clinical trials. So with that, I would like to first thank um, all the Colin Garanto lab and all the funding bodies that have allowed us to do all this work in the last years. 
and of course, all the collaborators and people involved in those projects uh, for all their contributions. And if now you have any questions, I will be happy to try to answer them. Yeah, Alex, uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for this great uh, overview. Um, I, I think it's very nice to see this overview from uh, uh, discovering the mutations to do the first uh, clinical work, to, to test some anti-sense oligos using this mini system to go to the more uh, elegant uh, model systems, the IPSC derived neurons or, uh, or organoids, all the way to the first uh, clinical trial. So it's really a, a very nice uh, overview. So the first question, uh, so because it all starts with finding the, the mutations that you can treat. So I think you have a very elegant uh, system developed for this. So, so, so for all the mutations that you found in the lab um, that involve uh, splice deficits. So for how many of them can you uh, find oligos that can restore uh, 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 the function? Is it for all of them or are there also some that are uh, rather difficult to, uh, to solve? Yeah. From all the, the splicing defects that we have tried so far, only one we were not able to correct. The others, we were always um, well, able to at least find one oligonucleotide that was able to redirect splicing. In the case of the one that we were not able to redirect, it was an exon elongation in, uh, in the acceptor site. And therefore, we think that the AUN was probably blocking um, the, um, the, um, yeah, the, the branch point, and therefore, the splicing did not, could not occur. And for that reason, we think that it's the, it's the only case where we were not able to redirect splicing so far. And for other kind of mutations, so these are all uh, uh, mostly splice mutations. So, but what what for uh, uh, point mutations or other kind of mutations? Did you work on these as well? Well, for this, the problem of of ABCA4 is it's a transmembrane protein. Therefore, the strategies like, for example, uh, for DMD of exon skipping of uh, internal regions it will not be an option because it will disrupt the entire protein because of the transmembrane domains, but also in the uh, cytoplasmic domains, there are other domains that are needed for the protein, uh, the protein function. So exon skipping in those cases would be uh, difficult. If we talk about other therapies, the problem of ABCA4 is it it does not fit in a conventional uh, adeno-associated virus because it's too large to fit in there. But there are already strategies where they are suggesting the use of dual AABs for um, do the classical gene augmentation therapy. Thank you. So, uh, there, so what I must say, so if you have a question for Alex, please use the chat function or the Q&A function. So both are fine. I can see both of them. Uh, there are already some questions uh, for Alex. So I, I will just come to the first question. That's a more general question for, uh, for us. So if you want to, uh, uh, because we are recording this, uh, this session, and Alex also mentioned the um, NS1 talk uh, given by uh, Billeke, but also all the other uh, webinars that we have. So you can find these on the OTS webpage. Just browse to the OTS webpage, go to the uh, webinar section, and uh, we will upload this uh, this webinar in in a few days from uh, from today. So uh, um, then you can uh, just rewatch this uh, very uh, very nice uh, uh, presentation from Alex. And then uh, because I want to make the link between the the NS1 studies. And, uh, and you were because you mentioned that you have like uh, most of the mutations that you found in, in, in the initial uh, screen are very unique mutations. You only have one or a few patients, but you also have mutations uh, that occur with uh, that you have like uh, many more patients. So, so, um, and you say, okay, well, we can use this unique mutations that are only occurring with one or two patients, we can uh, move these to start like the NS1 clinical trial. So are the differences, or what is the difference between a, uh, a very rare mutation and a very common mutation in developing the therapies? So do you need to do more if it's a very common mutation in a sense of more safety screens, uh, toxicity screens, uh, preclinical work? Can you comment a bit on this? Well, I think for 
the the the, the end of one or and a very few a little few <laughs> i think the and conventional clinical trial in any case will not be possible at all because you cannot have enough controls enough probands etc so in those cases the end of one strategy uh, could be an option and of course uh, it will depend on the regulatory uh, bodies of each country and in principle it, it can be done in an academic setting uh, milasen was the the example that i think uh, inspired all of us to do this kind of end of one trials um, for more recurrent variants, um, the end of one trials, I don't think it's going to work because probably the regulatory um, bodies will ask for more safety and more proof that is safe. But at the same time, if it's possible to prove that for one patient was safe, maybe for the others, it can be translated as well. And probably for those more safety will be needed and uh, they should go more towards a phase one to clinical trial rather than an end of one trial. But I think at the end, it's also important to, to see whether, it's, uh, as I said in, in the first slide, actually, uh, for uh, at least retinal diseases, it is important to know the baseline and whether there are still cells that can be treated. That's the most important part, because if there's nothing left, um, unfortunately, uh, we cannot treat them anymore because photoreceptors are neurons and they do not divide. So then we should think more about other options like uh, implants or maybe cell therapy if at some point we can implant photoreceptors. Yeah, so, uh, it's very nice, thank you. So I will continue with a question from uh, Hillary and she asked us to, to continue on this uh, particular topic on the NS1 study. So do you have to do rodent uh, tox studies? And uh, the other question is, can you do systemic delivery? Yes or no? Or how do you deliver this to the, to the eye? I will start for, for the second question because it's uh, easier to answer. So uh, the, if we want to treat the eye, the best option is to uh, do the intraocular injection because you also avoid potential off targets or toxic effects in the rest of the body. Uh, if you do it uh, systemically, you can have immune responses uh, or other type of toxicity that you don't want. And in the eye, at least it's local delivery, it reaches the retina and it's quite safe and e easy to deliver. And the other question about the rodents, uh, for the end of one, of course, the, the more, I mean, at the end, it will be a clinician who is going to deliver this molecule. So uh, the, the safer it is, the better. So, but I'm not per se, yeah, for Milasen, it was done. And may, maybe this, uh, the uh, Anemike or Vileke could uh, answer better, but, um, I don't think per se is needed, but uh, the, the rodent part, but some kind of, uh, I, I know that there are also some in vitro assays where you can check the, whether the, the antisense can be uh, toxic or not without having to do uh, all the, the in vivo animals. But some toxicity uh, in rodents will probably be needed for larger clinical trials and if you want to be extra safe. Yeah, I can recall, I think they had a call with AMA last week, and what I can recall is that no tox studies are required for this NS1 uh, study, so, uh, but I think they are doing it uh, anyway. Uh, just yeah, to be, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's maybe sorry. because it's to be extremely careful. I mean, at the end, the molecule will be injected into a patient. So what about if it's toxic at the end? What will happen with the clinician that administered the oligo? So you want yeah. to be extra careful with that. Yeah, I have a question. Also, uh, it's very nice. So a lot of questions on this NS1 or on the uh, on the clinical uh, part. So um, can you comment if you have a retina-specific preclinical safety testing approach to select the best molecules? Well, uh, we do not have a specific test. What we did in the past, um, uh, we injected the oligos for set 90 into the mouse retina, and then we checked whether there were uh, apoptosis after sacrificing the animal, of course, and uh, whether there was gliosis, that is a marker of retinal um, uh, defect, so, uh, and, and markers like this. I know that uh, in other papers, they uh, use rabbits to, um, to assess cytokine, um, yeah, um, production. And uh, of course, you can also check the, the toll receptors, whether they will be increased or not. But yeah, 
we don't have a specific test where we just did basic morphology and uh, gliosis and apoptosis. We did not see anything, so we did not uh, continue with that. But uh, yeah, for sure, there are other things that can be checked. And I have another question, also uh, things going on uh, on a similar uh, topic. So from uh, Sebastian, uh, for preclinical ocular toxicology risk assessment trials, testing ASO IVT in the eye, what other species on top of non-human primates would you recommend? So rats, rabbit, dogs, uh, horses, whatever. Uh, and what's, what would be the best fit or most sensitive and why? Well, I mean, uh, for toxicity, in, uh, as I mentioned, the, the rabbit is good for the cytokines because it's extremely sensitive. Uh, at the end, anyway, in all cases, people go to uh, non-human primates because they are, they are kind of re um, required at this moment. But usually at least you only go to two, three maximum animals. But you can already, uh, if you start, for example, with four leads, and you see that your in vitro says that one potentially is toxic, you end up then with three. Then you test in the rabbit, maybe you end up then with one, and this is the one that will go to the non-human primate. But I think mainly it will be, uh, I would say mouse rat, rabbit, and, and then of course, non-human primates. But uh, there are also in vitro assays that can be tested, can be used. Yeah, then I have a question on the, on the clinical trial. So uh, I think uh, the, Preclinical results were great, but uh, the the preclinical tests were a bit, uh, or the clinical uh, trial was a bit uh, disappointing. So uh, I have a question from uh, from uh, Jan. He says uh, the 160 80 micro microgram dose for a human eye seems rather low, uh, which from the outside could explain the lack of toxicity as well as the lack of efficacy. So were higher doses tested? Yeah, yeah, for the phase one, two clinical trial, there were two doses tested, 160, 80, and 320, uh, 160. Actually, um, based on presentations I saw from ProQR, because the, uh, as far as I know, the final results of the phase one, two clinical trial uh, have not been published yet, but the, actually the low dose were, were the best respondents and the, the ones having less uh, side effects. The uh, high dose, um, the majority of them did not respond. And uh, they also tend to have uh, produced cataracts that of course uh, it's quite easy to remove them, but it was in the high dose. So actually that dose was more uh, effective in the phase one to clinical trial. So it's not that low as it may seem because it's, injected in the eye. It's not in the entire body. It's only in the eye. Yeah, indeed. these are very local uh, injections. So I have a question on the, from Hillary again, I have a question on the chemistry that you use. So uh, can you please comment on the chemistry? Uh, why did you choose to work with this particular chemistry and have you tried others? Yeah, so we, we started with the 2-OME phosphorothioate in the very first studies, well, in, in the septo 90 study and also in the first studies of ABCA4, um, mainly the, the reason is at that time, the two OME was um, commercially available for everyone. And then later on, uh, the two MOE was uh, also available and we switched to the two MOE. So actually nowadays we only work with the MOE, but at that time we were still using the two OME. So that's mainly the, the reason, but uh, in principle, nowadays we know, I think in the field that the two, oh, uh, the two MOE is quite, uh, usually quite efficacious and uh, less uh, toxic, although the two OME is also not that toxic depending, uh, at least for the eye. But uh, yeah, I think it's quite common knowledge nowadays in the, in the field. That seems to be a good uh, guess. So I have a question myself because I'm really uh, so I really like your uh, your organoid model. I think it's a very nice and elegant model. Uh, so, um, but it takes quite some time, right? You have to culture these cells for uh, 180 days. Um, so, uh, what are the functional readouts that you use? So, what do you want to see if you have these 180 or 200 or 250 days uh, organoids? Well, at this moment we were basing everything on RNA level. That's the good thing of having a splicing defect. You assume that if you correct the splicing defect at RNA level, the protein levels will be increased and everything will be fine. 
But it's true that for ABCA4 in particular, we don't have a functional readout. For set to 90, we could measure ciliation because it's expressed in the cilium, so we could measure other things. But for ABCA4, it's not the case. So basically, we are trying to see whether we can robustly detect the protein. And um, the, the problem of the organoids is that they also do not develop the outer segments properly because they are in the outside part, so they break and they do, cannot grow because they don't have the support of the other layers of the retina. So for that reason, we are also working on a retina on a chip where we can combine all the layers. Um, we also want to uh, uh, check whether we can do something with uh, the, the, um, the function of, of ABCA4, whether we can do an enzymatic assay or we can uh, detect any component of the visual cycle. So basically we are trying to prove that ABCA4 increases and that uh, we can have a functional readout. Yeah, and then a more practical question based on this. So you have to culture these cells for 200 days. So how often do you uh, have to do you need to treat the organoids? So I, I can imagine you need to treat the organoids to see the molecular effect. You can treat them for, for a few days, but to see a, a functional, to restore a functional effect, you might want to treat them for a longer period. Of, any thoughts on this? Well, we, we know based on other studies that we can deliver the antisense oligonucleotide three or four weeks, even before harvesting and maybe even longer, but we can also do repetitive um, deliveries. I mean, it's quite easy because it's just putting the AON in the media. We don't need to do uh, any transfection or electroporation or whatsoever. It enters quite nicely. And in that sense, uh, of if we think eventually, if the, the effect of the oligo will be lost because of the long period of time, and usually we anyway deliver the oligo towards the end of the differentiation, not at the beginning, because it recapitulates more the situation of the patient. So the patient is never inject, uh, treated before the, the, the disease starts. So basically, the more we wait, the more similar would be. But uh, yeah, for now, we do not know exactly how much we need to wait, but we are doing everything in ranges of 48 to one week, maybe one month but we still don't have uh, consistent data. Okay, well, uh, thank you uh, very much, Alex. So uh, I think we have uh, great answers on all the scientific questions. I have one more question before we uh, wrap up. So this is a question about your career. So you started your career in, uh, in Spain and somehow you decided to move uh, to the Netherlands. So, so, so can you comment a bit on your career? So how is it to go to another country in Europe? Uh, um, and, and how, do, how do you deal with these kind of uh, things? Well, I mean, my, my experience is positive I, I, and I actually will encourage everyone to go abroad. So in my case, uh, during my PhD, I already went to the US, to Oklahoma City. And then, um, yeah, I always was told that, if, yeah, if you want to have an academic career, you should go for your postdoc abroad. And I came for two, three years max, and at the end, it's already nine and a half. And I established my own group here, so I, I, I don't have any complaint. But yeah, I think it's, I would encourage everyone to at least try it for two years, go somewhere else, and yeah, learn about how the, the people work in other labs and maybe other cultures, other systems. I mean, that's the most difficult part, adapting to a new system, having to know, okay, what do I need uh, to succeed in this system? Because you always compare to your own system that is the one you are familiar with. So, but at the end, everything worked out for me. And uh, for me, it was a very positive experience. I will repeat uh, it again. So. <laughs> no, thank for the great advice for the positive experience. So Alex, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing all these data. Um, so if you uh, want to watch the, the webinar, so please go to the OTS website, go to uh, webinars, and then you can find uh, this presentation and all the previous presentations. Um, and then uh, just to say it one more time, so if you want to present yourself during this webinar series, uh, please contact uh, myself or contact Aaron. Also, this you can do via the uh, OTS uh, website. Uh, and then we're happy to uh, uh, to give you uh, some time to uh, to present your uh, ongoing work. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, see you in uh, in two weeks.